Welcome back to the Gun Academy. I'm Will DiPaolo. Today we are going to continue our series on uh, the different types of bacteria you may find in your gut and sort of what they are functions are and how we may be able to increase or decrease them using our diets. So let's jump right in. Today we're going to be talking about lactobacillus species. Um, you haven't probably, um, you won't, wouldn't be able to take a probiotic or eat yogurt without having seen at least one of the lactobacillus um, species listed on the ingredients of either the probiotic or the yogurt or kefir that you're ingesting. Uh, the lactobacillus is a bacteria that is found in our environment. It's often used in food production, as well as being a commensal bacteria that can reside and can be found within our intestines. Um, lactobacillus bacteria are um, some of the most extensively and ubiquitously used bacteria in probiotic preparations. Uh, there are a lot of different members of this bacteria and they make up um, a lot, a major part of what we call lactic acid bacteria or LABs. Lactic acid producing bacteria are gram positive bacteria and they produce lactic acid during carbohydrate fermentation. Uh, the metabolic versatility of lactobacillus results in the ability of these microbes to colonize a variety of habitats. So they can be found within plant species, they can be found within animals, they can be found within raw milk and food products. This makes um, this, the lactobacillus is actually one of the largest um, families of bacteria with over a hundred different species and subspecies within it. So it's a large, because of the number of lactobacillus that are found within this species, or within this genus, it's a highly diverse and a very large group that shows lots of variation and variability. Um, it's uh, reflected, so I mentioned before, it can colonize a lot of different types of um, species you can find in plants and animals and in foods. Um, there's also a lot of phenotypic and genotypic variation within the lactobacillus family. So not only at the level of where they can live, but the genes that they express and the ability to express those genes is very different within that within this bacterial group. Um, there's a lot of attempts to div to classify this genus into phylogenetic groups. Um, and this has been revised many of times throughout the years, but really there's been established a few groups of uh, bacteria that um, can be grouped together um, that are all from the lactobacillus family. So um, lactobacillus acidophilus is one that you may have heard of. This species is often found in probiotics. Um, it also plays an important role in starter cultures in different dairy and vegetable fermentations. Some of the bacteria related to L. acidophilus are called L. helveticus and lactob lactobacillus delbruchii. Um, these also can be found within the gut and can be considered commensal bacteria. Um, lactobacillus casei is a second sort of group of these um, lactobacillus. These are the most um, the, the most well-known species that are related to L. casei are L. paracasei and L. rhamnosus or lactobacillus rhamnosus. These are commonly found in different cheeses and cheese preparations. Um, L. lactobacillus paracasei um, are also considered human commensals and can be found within the GI tract. Lactobacillus plantarum is another sort of grouping of lactobacillus. These are food grade bacteria because they have a long history of being safe and well tolerated in fermented foods such as dairy foods, meats and vegetables. Um, they also have been shown to survive gastric transit time so they can make it from your mouth to your intestine without being too injured by the acids of the stomach and they can colonize and live within the, the gut. Um, of humans. And lastly, um, Lactobacillus ruteri and its related sort of members. Um, there's six species that are all kind of related to Lactobacillus ruteri. These are um, have been isolated from sourdough and sourdough preparations. Um, L Lactobacillus fermentum um, is considered one of these and it's also been found in a lot of vegetable and dairy ferments. One of the most interesting things about Lactobacillus ruteri is that it produces an antimicrobial compound called ruterin and also ruterocyclin. These um, have the ability to kill other microbes. So basically they come armed with their own antibiotics to wipe out bacteria that um, they are in their niche so that they can create an environment for themselves. This makes them really useful in the gut, um, protecting from pathogens and pathogenic bacteria. 
So these bacteria, lactobacillus, have been used for decades in food production. Um, I've already mentioned that the lactic acid that they produce creates an acidic environment that keeps uh, pathogens and pathogenic bacteria at bay. And they also produce antimicrobial compounds called bacteriosins that also can keep uh, bacteria, like pathogenic bacteria, at bay. And this lends to its capability for food preservation and it allows that food to be preserved for a longer amount of time because of less contamination with these sort of bad or negative pathogenic species of bacteria. Um, lactobacillus also produce something called an exopolysaccharide. These are aromatic compounds that enhance the flavor, the texture, and the nutrition of low-fat products. And this makes it ideal for cultures, uh, starter cultures, and complementary cultures for cheese varieties, sourdough breads, and actually even can be used in wine and beer uh, preparations. Um, so lactobacillus has this sort of big history as being part of food production and, and, and food preparations, but they do live in the gut, and they can be found normally in the gut microbiome. Um, the role there is to, they have a number of important roles actually. They um, aid in our nutri uh, nutrient digestion and absorption of different compounds. They produce, bacteria, they produce serotonin and um, the neurotransmitter GABA and acetylcholine um, from their um, metabolic product, products. Um, they can also inhibit pathogenic bacteria, and they also have been shown in many different studies to be um, anti-inflammatory and to stimulate the immune system in such a way that promotes uh, um, immunity and, and keeps um, pathogenic bacteria at bay. Uh, many different lactobacillus have been used in research to um, pr promote anti-inflammatory responses, either through the production of a cytokine or a product called interleukin-10, um, as well as TGF-beta, and these can be used to induce regulatory T cells that can suppress an inflammatory response. There's also been an association of the um, immunoglobulin or the antibody that's of IgA that's really important to maintain the health of the mucosal um, system and the gut mucosa. So uh, a wide variety of uses, uh, very important for metabolic uh, products that we, that we use as uh, nutrients, but also um, protects from pathogens and can induce immune responses that are really important for our bodies. So a really important and a really critical species that we find um, these lactobacillus are for, for us. And that's one reason why they became so, um, so popular when we started looking at probiotics and when people started trying to utilize um, by feeding uh, different bacteria and, and sort of manipulating immune responses and, and looking to see the role, if you could dampen or decrease or even alleviate symptoms of different diseases using lactobacillus and other lactobacillus species. Um, the, the, the role of probiotics is still controversial. Um, I've done a couple videos on these and I think it'd be good for you to go check them out if you wanted more information. But mainly what is uh, problematic is that we don't understand the role of probiotics as far as um, which probiotics work for which people. Um, there's an idea that some people are more responsive to probiotics um, and that some probiotics are more, uh, more responsive with certain people. So there's sort of a two-way street here where we're trying to figure out whether or not people you know, are there really non-responders and responders to probiotics, or do some people just respond more preferentially to certain types of probiotics and not to others? And so, the even though there's been a lot of research out there on probiotics, we still don't understand a lot of it, and, and I think we'll see a lot more over the next few years as people start turning their attention to um, these sort of nuanced questions about how probiotics work and in what individuals and under what conditions. And so I think we have to just be patient and we'll get some answers to those questions in the coming years. But for right now, um, in my opinion and, and what you, we see from the literature, probiotics, yes, they do have an effect, but we don't know who they're effective for and which probiotics are effective for which diseases. Some studies that have looked at lactobacillus have shown that um, children or infants suffering from necrotizing enterocolitis can benefit from the administration of lactobacillus. Um, acute infectious diarrhea caused by viruses, as well as antibiotic-associated diarrhea, can be alleviated by 
um, the administration of probiotics with lactobacillus in them. Uh, lactobacillus can also alleviate symptoms of constipation. Um, they've been used in uh, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth patients as well as IBD patients and um, some allergic diseases. But, you know, there again, this is not, um, if you're suffering from one of these, it's not a guarantee that the lactobacillus probiotic will help you. Uh, we still don't know. Um, so I think even though there are promising results from these studies, it wasn't 100% success rate. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, if you want to increase your levels of lactobacillus, and, and why not, because it's a great bacteria to have in your gut, and if you can increase those levels, like you should definitely try to do that. Um, the best way to do it, I think, is through um, eating fermented foods like kimchi and sauerkraut, or eating milk-based products like kefir and yogurt. The reason why is that um, not only are you giving the probiotic because they're present in those um, foods and in those um, milk-based products, but at the same time, there's also prebiotics that are there to help feed other gut bacteria and also to feed these bacteria and to help them colonize. So any time where you can use fermented foods or you can eat a prebiotic that is also included with that probiotic, I think is a benefit. Um, I think there are uses for probiotic um, pills out there that are mostly lactobacillus, but again, we don't know how well they colonize. We don't even know if they colonize or not. Uh, whereas I think um, the fermented foods at least give you that double punch of the probiotic, but also the prebiotic that can help feed other good bacteria that might be present in your gut. And so um, that is sort of the idea and then the information out there about lactobacillus species. So if you are interested in um, increasing those bacteria in your gut and helping to, um, and you like to eat these fermented foods, that's the way to go. And um, until next time, I'm William DePaulo, and this is the Gut Academy. Thank you.